Hello and welcome everyone around the world for another exclusive presentation right here on Your Contact. For the very best in UFO Paranormal Talk Radio on the World Wide Web, you're locked into KGRARadio.com. It is time, as we do every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, to bring you Grant Cameron and the Cameron Files. And now, your host, Grant Cameron. Good evening. It's Grant Cameron. You're listening to the Cameron Files. Tonight, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of having a guest, I'm going to do a presentation on Area 51. In up- upcoming weeks, I will also do uh, presentations on contact modalities and on red flags with the TTSA. The reason I'm doing the Area 51 story is because it has gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of months, and I was actually involved in the story when it was actually happening in 1988 and 1989. I call my presentation UFOs, red flags, and Area 51. And it's important to look at the red flags in a story, but I look at it a little bit differently. Uh, Area 51 has become a big story. We have the the famous mailbox. Uh, I first went there a couple of uh, weeks ago, actually. I'd never been there before. I really didn't have any interest. I actually went there, and people have done all sorts of stuff, but little... Uh, alien faces made out of stones on the ground there. And it's become almost like a very sort of um, famous cult-like story. To show you how big the story is, what you can actually do is go into Google search and then take a subject such as the Pyramid of Cheops. Take the Pyramid of Cheops, put it into a Google search, and Pyramid of Cheops is pretty famous. And what you'll come up with is 1,150,000 hits. If you take the word Donald uh, Trump, put it into a Google search, you will get 1,650,000,000 hits. And that's what most people would think is probably the most famous term today. If, however, you take Area 51 and put it into a Google search, you will get 3,320,000,000 hits. Air 51 has become one of the most famous stories, one of the most famous names in the world. You can go almost anywhere in the world, say Area 51, and people know exactly what you're talking about. The thing is, before 1988, nobody would have known what you're talking about. The, the term did not exist. And that's part of what has sort of bothered me about the Air 51 story to start. And that has to do with. A lot of people have a theory that all this has been counterintelligence. The whole Area 51 story was a story that the U.S. government put out there just because they wanted to sort of throw people off. They wanted to um, distract the Russians. They wanted to, um, you know, they, they figured maybe the UFO community wouldn't buy into it, but the, the smartest of uh, KGB agents in the, in the Soviet Union who were aware of intelligence practices would somehow fall for the story that there was UFOs and aliens at Area 51, and that would sort of be like a honey trap, and they would go in and be, get caught trying to find out what's going on in Area 51. The same thing goes now. It's very common now with the TTSA story. There's a lot of people that believe the TTS story is just a setup. It's the government's disinformation to throw off the Russians, to throw off the UFO community, to distract the UFO community, to um, sort of diminish the fact that the U.S. government may be doing some sort of research with UFOs. And in reality, this is like totally crazy stuff. George Knapp used to bring up the the term, and I used the term as well. When it comes to Area 51, if this was a plan to throw people off about 
a top secret base that nobody even knew was there. How well did that work out? When it comes to TTSA, how well did this actually work? If we make the assumption that Lou Alzando was some sort of bad guy who was put into the community to distract people from UFOs, to diminish the story, how well did that actually work out? You basically have a situation now where almost every reporter in the United States may not be doing a story on UFOs, but if they go to the Pentagon, I can almost guarantee you national security reporters would be doing any sort of story at the Pentagon. And I'm sure the Pentagon's getting all sorts of things. Oh, well, we got this story finished. By the way, let me ask you a question. What do you think about that UFO story? That do you, do, Have you heard anything in the Pentagon? They are dealing with over 2,000 FOIAs. They're inundated with FOIAs on this story about TTSA, about um, uh, the ATIP program, $22 million spent by the U.S. government. You have Congress that's actually gotten involved in this thing and is interviewing witnesses from the Nimitz. And so the idea that it's counterintelligence, that somehow this distracted people from looking at UFOs, I would say it's almost like the same thing as the Area 51 story. With the ATIP story, with that leak in December of 2017 to the New York Times, Politico, and Washington Post, I mean, if you were some high-level general in the Pentagon, you'd want to bring in Who's the guy that came up with this idea about putting out a UFO story that has caused piles of media to ask questions, all these FOAs to be filed? They would want to have that guy dragged into the, the office of the general just so he could personally pull the guy's stripes off. He would just be furious. And then they would say, let's, let's crucify this guy. Let's torture this guy. Let's kill this guy. Like, this is the stupidest idea that ever came up. Every 51 falls in the same category. Before 1988, before this story started to break, nobody knew, very few people knew there was a top secret base north of Las Vegas that we were doing top secret SR-71 tests, uh, tests of the U-2, uh, tests of drones, uh, tests of the Aurora, tests of, of the stealth fighter. Nobody knew that. So the idea that they would put this story out and that somehow this distracted people from the base, as I'll explain later on in the presentation, there was, there was a guy by the name of Billy Goodman who was running a radio show at the time. Uh, we were actually exchanging audio tapes of this guy's radio show. This was viral. Billy, Billy Goodman was taking buses up on the weekends, up to Area 51, up into the mountains, so that people could sit and watch what was going on at the base. And suddenly you had the most top secret base in the world that nobody knew where it was. And suddenly you had all these people up on top of the mountains, looking down, on, and they could actually see the base. They had telescopes, they had cameras, they had all this kind of stuff, and they were actually watching what was going on in the base. So if this was a counterintelligence operation, as George Knapp would say, how do you think that actually worked out? Do you think it actually worked that they distracted people from investigating what was going on at Air 51? So that's why I want to start with this counterintelligence thing is, is kind of a crazy idea that this was done by counterintelligence. I have my own theory, which may or may not be right, but I'll go through my theory of what happened. And when you look at all the red flags in the Area 51 story, you will see how this thing actually came together. And the, the red flags are indications that show you, yes, there's, there's something here that you gotta look at, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a hoax. It just means this is a part of the story that really doesn't make that much sense. And it all goes back to this whole thing that Bob Lazar was the key to the story according to most accounts. I will say the key to the story was not Bob Lazar, the key to the story was actually John Lear. So you have all these red flags, and to me the red flags just mean that you have to go through and not ignore the red flags, but to go through and try to figure out when something doesn't make sense in a story, what does it actually mean? There's an analogy to this, and this is the story of Jackie Gleason, who was big time into UFOs, a comedian, famous comedian, 50s, 60s, 70s, who was very much into UFOs. Uh, there's a famous story about his second wife telling the story that 
Richard Nixon uh, had taken Jackie Gleason to an Air Force base in California or in Florida to show him the bodies. Jackie Gleason was one of many musicians who could not read or write music. A great number of the famous musicians could not read or write music. Jackie Gleason was one. And yet he had an orchestra. He had his own orchestra. He put out 20 record albums. And when he would compose a, a, a song, he would actually sort of hum it or sing it to a guy, and that guy would compose the music. He really didn't know anything about reading or writing music. And yet when he had his orchestra, the whole orchestra would be playing. Jackie Gleason could pick up one single person playing one single instrument who had made a mistake. He was that good. And this is the idea of red flags, is that you listen to the music, and when there's a, a, somebody has missed a note, you pick up on the note and you don't prejudge it. You don't say uh, it's a it's a hoax or whatever. You just say that shouldn't be there. Why did that event happen? And there are a lot of red flags in the Area 51 story that when you start looking at them, start to explain exactly what actually happened. Now, in every lecture that I do, every presentation I do, I always reference the fact that there are three options that could be going on with any UFO story that has to do with the government, with disclosure. And that is, is the government disclosing, doing full disclosure? Are they doing a cover-up or are they doing something in between? And I maintain, and I still maintain, the only thing that makes sense is they are not doing full disclosure. If the U.S. government wanted to do full disclosure, they would stand the president up or they would stand the CIA director up and they would just basically show you the crafts, the bodies. They would come out as the rumor was in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan left the office that Ronald Reagan was going to appear on a UFO documentary called UFO Cover Up Live. And he was going to appear with the live alien on that documentary. And that would be disclosure. And in, in this period, and this is exactly when the Area 51 story occurred, was when this documentary took place, as I'll point out later. We actually thought this might actually happen because this was a big story back in the, in the, in the late eighties that Reagan was going to do this disclosure thing. So if the, if, if the president or whoever is running the UFO story wants to disclose, they can disclose anytime they want, but they're not doing that. They, if you look at any other country in the world, Canada, Switzerland, Australia, they're, they're, they're doing a, a sort of a cover-up thing. They're basically just not talking about it. And that is where I say, if, if you say the U.S. government is covering this story up, they're not covering the story up either. Because if they wanted to cover up, they would do what all these other countries in the world have done, and that's just shut up and quit talking about it. And the story would go away, as it has in Canada, as it has in Switzerland. There's nobody in Canada that really talks about what is the Canadian government doing? Or who's investigating? Uh, do they have uh, alien craft? Do they have bodies? Do they? Nobody asks that because nobody talks about it. It's just it's a non-subject in Canada. And yet in the United States, you have all these whistleblowers. You have all these people coming forward. You have the government leaking stories into newspapers and stuff. So the government is not, in my opinion, just doing this full disclosure. They're not doing a cover-up. They're doing something in between. And that, I believe, is a... Um, a limited disclosure that has plausible deniability to it where they can slowly leak the story out so that if they get into a, a problem with the story, they can basically pull the story back anytime they want. And when you see the red flags of Area 51, you'll see this is one of the main efforts that they did to try to sort of move the story out there, get people to look at it, and yet had the ability at any time to pull the story back. But as I'll point out later on, they actually sort of messed up the Area 51 story. It sort of got out of control and they had to, it took them years to get the this, this story back under control. The, there's a famous Canadian government document, the top secret memo from November of 1950, in which the, um, the, the, the Canadian government is told by the Americans that this is the most highly classified subject in the United States. And so you have the, 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 the Canadians getting this material and identifying that this is highly secret material. Now, part of, part of the Area 51 story that I think is, a, is, a, is a, um, a red flag is a lot of people believe that Bob Lazar was a whistleblower, that Bob Lazar was a guy who um, decided he was going to come clean. And I will point out a number of things that will show you that he was not a whistleblower. Um, a whistleblower 
I have never been approached by a whistleblower in 43 years. I've never been threatened. The key to the, this story is, is that if you are the, the, the um, government that controls the, the most highly classified secret in the, in, in the United States or in the world, if somebody starts to leak the material, there is a, a law, US 18 Code 798, which says that you leak classified material, they'll put you in jail for each count 10 years. And so the idea that somebody is running around with classified material and handing it out to people is totally crazy because as you'll see, as I'll point out later on, nothing happened to Lazar. Lazar put this material in and nothing happened to him. They allowed him to do this material and that would indicate that the material that he was putting out was not top secret or it was material that had been authorized for a leak. The other problem I have with the whistleblower theory, and this goes to researchers who will constantly tell me I've got some guy who's giving me this top secret material and he's leaking this material and he's afraid the government's going to kill him and, you know, goes on and on and on. I, you know, I, I sometimes point out you have to realize that if you receive classified material, you're under violation of the law as well. You are not allowed to receive, if you know someone's giving you classified top secret material that's special access, you can go to jail for 10 years as well. And that's US, uh, 18 U.S. Code 793, the receiving classified material. So I, that's, part of, that's an important part of the Air 51 story that I don't believe anybody is really leaking classified material. Something else was going on there. You take a look at with the classified material, when the Majestic 12 document was uh, became public in December of 1984, or actually it, it, it was released to the researchers then, it wasn't made public until the MUFON conference in June, I believe it was June of um, 1987. Um, when that story broke, the FBI actually did an investigation on the MJ-12 document. And because the whole thing was, did someone leak classified material? The, do the document was, was marked top secret and there was some, some question. So the FBI actually did an investigation. And I have talked to researchers about this, uh, people who say to me, oh, I was given this document by somebody and it's, you know, it's a secret document or whatever. And I always tell people very clearly, if you think someone has given you a classified piece of material, classified document, you are uh, in violation of the law and you better run as fast as you can to the FBI and report that, that, that you've received this document. I had one just recently and that guy did go to the FBI and the FBI came and uh, his two computers, they basically copied everything that was on his two computers. They take this very seriously when someone is leaking classified material. So the idea that Lazar was running around leaking classified material and that the government couldn't stop him or tried to kill him and couldn't kill him or whatever the story is, that, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't, that's not, I don't believe it's true at all. I believe he either, it was not classified material that he was leaking or as I will point out with all the rest of the red flags, you will see this was absolutely intended. They want him to do this whole thing. I first wrote about it. A lot of people don't know. I first wrote about the story. I was actually involved in this story as it was happening. I knew about the story before Bob Lazar even went public. I was dealing with a number of the researchers, a number of the, the people. We had a little bit. My co-author, we wrote a book called UFOs, MJ-12 and the Government. My co-author, T. Scott Crane, was dealing a little bit with George Knapp at the time. I was dealing with uh, John Lear, who's a key to the story. Um, Gene Huff, this was the very early days of the internet. This was, um, yeah, I think it was, it was like there was these chat boards. There was no photographs on the internet. There was nothing. It was just these chat boards. And the vast majority of the chatting on the internet was about UFOs. And so a number of the people there at the time, Gene Huff was one of the key people, was posting material, and there was a lot of discussion on this board as it was breaking. So I was in, involved in that whole thing, and my co-author and I put a book together in 1991, but we were following this story as, as, it, as, it, as it unraveled. The other person that was doing research that a lot of, I haven't heard anybody reference in the last couple of months who did tremendous research in this was Timothy Good, who wrote the book Alien Liaison. And he was there at the time, and he interviewed um, uh, Bob Lazar 
at great depth. He talked a lot to, to George Knapp when he, when he was doing this investigation. And he wrote an account in Alien Liaison that's about 30 or 35 pages and is extremely accurate. Basically, he came up with the same sort of material that I came up with as to what he thought was going on or a lot of the details that really haven't been mentioned by a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff that he brought up and that I brought up in my first book and in a second book that we wrote later on where people have sort of glossed over this or haven't talked about some of this other stuff. The key to the entire story, in my opinion, the Area 51 story, is if you want to know what happened with the Area 51 story, you got to realize the importance of John Lear in the story. John Lear was very famous at the time. Uh, he was uh, had all these air certificates. He'd flown all these planes. He'd flown for the CIA. He had run for state senator in um, in Nevada. His um, father had invented the Lear jet. Um, he was extremely, extremely famous. And um, at the time when this story whole story broke. One of the things that people really haven't brought up is the fact that John Lear was in 1988, 1989, he was the MUFON state director for Nevada. In the same year that the Lazar story broke, the Area 51 story broke, there was the MUFON conference was held in Las Vegas, Nevada. And John Lear was in charge of the conference. And he had a lot of very... Um, I guess, unorthodox ideas. He had come up with a bunch of stuff and they actually pulled a conference from him. He provided us a number of uh, photographs for the book. We, I, I talked to him uh, at, at fairly great length. I talked to him on the phone um, and he was famous for actually getting on the Area 51 base long before the camo dudes, before the very high security that, that, that was sort of built um, after they probably moved the UFO material from Wright-Patterson to uh, Area 51, according to the rumor that was in the early 1980s, they moved the material there. And then the security got very, very tight. But he was on the base in the 1970s. He actually walked the, I think he told me the story that the they had a, a, a guard shack there, but there was nobody at the guard shack. He just walked by. He went onto the base and he became famous for, um, uh, identifying a MiG jet that was outside of one of the hangars. And that's when that story got public. The idea was that the um, back engineering people in the U.S. military were uh, had captured a MiG jet and that they were test flying this thing at Area 51. The other thing that John, and this is an important part of the story to understand how this all unravels, is that John um, was um, also responsible for helping KLS-TV and that is the TV station that broke the Area 51 story. That's George Knapp's station. And that um, John Laird helped them break the stealth fighter story, that they had. The, they were testing the stealth technology at Area 51. And so the important part to remember is that um, KLS-TV was sort of indebted to John Lear for this story. So John gets involved in the UFO phenomena after talking to somebody from the Rendlesham story. Uh, he starts doing some investigation. He gets the UFO documents. He goes to uh, KLS TV with these documents. And because they're sort of indebted to him, they sort of listen to him. But um, George Knapp's boss says, no, no, there's no UFO stuff up there. There's nothing going up there. If, if there was going on up there, I would know about it. And he sort of told John, you know, get lost with your documents. I don't really want to see them or whatever. I don't believe it. And that's when George Knapp uh, talked to John as he was leaving the studio and said, let me look at those documents. This is how it all starts. And to, uh, to understand the story, you have to understand this connection because that's when the story gets out of control when KLS TV later does the story. So, um, I, we wrote the whole thing. We, we uh, wrote up the story about Bob Lazar in this 1991 book that we did. Uh, we detail what we did. And then later on, in uh, about 10 years ago, I did a second book called UFOs, um, Area 51, and Government Informants. And in that book, uh, really didn't change much on the Area 51 story. The, the story that I had in the early times uh, really didn't change much. Uh, I think we had it pretty clear back in those days. And um, we went through all the material 
And back to John Lear, who's the, the key thing. Now, John does not appear in the latest Jeremy Corbell movie. It has to do with sort of a fallout with various people. There's a bunch of people there. And there's, I think it has to do with a fallout um, there. So he's not in the movie, but he is the key figure. If you understand how he fits into the story, you understand what actually happened at Area 51. And as I point out, he's, he was very famous. And the other thing that uh, I haven't really heard in the last couple of months is this whole idea that John has openly talked numerous times about the fact that his phone was tapped. He talks about his daughters having these complaints about the phone, that they're having trouble with the phone. And he brings in his friend from the phone company to look at this thing. And the guy discovers a tap on the phone and it's not down the street. It's at the low, it's at the sort of the, the, the main um, um, junction. And he says to John, this is like a major tap. This is, this is not some, you know, your neighbor tapping you. And he, so he said, I'll, I'll figure it out. And John says, yeah, I know I'm tapped, whatever. And the guy goes and he comes back to John and he said, I talked to my boss about it. And my boss said, if you want to keep your job, just keep working. And um, so John knew his phone was tapped. And that's the important thing is that John was being monitored at the time. John was putting out a bunch of stuff at the time. This is what you have to realize. This is 1988. And John is famous for a lot of material. He writes the John Lear hypotheses and he gets into all the weird stuff, the Dulce uh, base underground shootout story, uh, the gray story about the, um, the, the grays. And um, uh, he, he becomes very good friends with uh, Bill Cooper, who to this day, his book is still many, many days is still a top selling UFO book. He wrote beyond the pale horse and Bill Cooper was filling auditoriums full of people. So John was very close to the, the Bill Cooper story until John put out what was called the Krill Papers, and then uh, Cooper said that he had gotten a briefing. His whole story was that he had gotten a briefing. Uh, he had done a briefing for the uh, for the Navy, and that this was part of the briefing. And John said, "No, it wasn't part of the briefing." And he said, "Yeah, I saw it in the briefing." He said, "No, I made it up. Krill, I made up the name. It's it's made up." Um, and he said, "No, I saw it in the briefing." And and then there was a break. He told he told Cooper to get out of the house. Uh, that he had sort of like John always refers to it as UFO sickness, that you, you have a little story and, and once the story gets going, then you, got, you suddenly become the center of attention and you got to keep the story going. So he broke with Cooper, but this is the important part, was that he had all these very, very sort of um, very con controversial ideas in the 1988-89. And that's why when he ran the MUFON conference in um, – Las Vegas in 1989, the same year that the Air 51 story was broken by KLS TV, they actually, the MUFON actually said, no, you're not going to bring in these speakers. He was going to bring in Bill Cooper. He was going to bring in all these very sort of bizarre speakers. And they said, no, you're not bringing in these speakers. Um, no, not going to happen. And so John actually ran his own conference down the street from the MUFON conference in 1989. And he told me that he got more people than the MUFON conference did. So you have to realize this very controversial figure, John Lear, who's putting out these very, very bizarre theories that all of us were watching. We, we knew this was very bizarre, but he was sort of the center of attention because he was so famous and that his phone was tapped. So the government was watching John Lear at the time. Now we did this other, as mentioned before, we'd done the book UFOs, Area 51 and Government Informants. Uh, we put that book, really didn't change that much, but it basically got some verifications of the stuff that we'd done earlier. Um, the Area 51 name itself, as I said, is very famous. And there's even, when I was at the, the Clinton Library, there was um, a file, and I filed for the file, and it was like 450 pages. They actually, and this is, you got to remember, this is the 1990s. Um, they, they had an actual Area 51 file, and a lot of it was kind of a waste of time because it was about lawsuits at area 51 about people dying with the this paint and this these toxic uh waste that they were burning there and people were coming out with these bizarre diseases and dying and this was this lawsuit that was going on with the against the government with these these people the the survivors of these people who had died on, at area 51 but in their in that um correspondence 450 pages that they released there was some some discussion about area 51 and there was even one very sort of uh, interesting um, 
uh, email going back and forth between two people where the person uses the one word area 51 and the other person says, Oh, by the way, we, we're not supposed to be using that term, but the file is actually called area 51. So it, it becomes very famous. And, uh, the, the, um, Clintons are, are watching it. The Clinton white house is watching it. And I pick up all this sort of stuff. The, the, um, there was also, as you know, if you know the, the Tom DeLong story, there was, you know, the sort of the idea that Tom had been at a skiff, maybe at area 51, um, talking to the Lockheed, uh, president, uh, Robert Weiss and with the head scientist and one, one other person who I'm not sure it was. Um, but this is like a, just a repeat of history. So uh, in the 1980s, the big researcher in the 1980s who had written the Roswell book and become famous, a viral book, was Bill Moore. And a lot of people don't really realize that Bill Moore, uh, I knew him at the time, I had done some work with him, that Bill Moore also claimed to have been at Area 51 as well. Uh, Lee Graham, who was a very close friend of his, who Bill would leak material through, uh, he was called the pigeon. He was the guy that would deliver these 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 things because he had a top he had a, a secret security clearance. And so what they would do with the UFO documents, Bill Moore would take these documents that they were getting from different sources and he would give them to Lee Graham. And Lee Graham, of course, as I said, when you receive a top secret document or a secret document that claims to have been leaked, you better report it. And that's what Lee Graham would do. He would immediately take the MJ-12 document, the Aquarius document, all these various documents that were being leaked to him by Bill Moore, and he would take them to a security manager at the, 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 the factory where he worked and report Bill Moore and these documents. And this, this was to force uh, a review of these documents, to somebody to do a review of these documents. So Bill Moore claimed to have been there, and Lee Graham said that he, I, I believe he told me that he actually saw a, a photograph of um, them landing at Area, 50, at Area 51 on, on the, 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 um, the, you could see the runway. And that Bill had sort of indicated and then had drawn a, uh, a plane, which was called the Goose, that he had seen at Air 51, this, this plane that he had been there. So Air 51 is just a repeating sort of thing where um, a lot of people have been fed material about Air 51. And I think this is done on purpose. I don't think this is accidental that these are whistleblowers. Um, and when you look at the Bill Moore thing, another thing that people don't really realize is the importance of Bill Moore. Bill Moore, the people will say, "Oh, you know, he was just a guy who made up these stories, made up the MJ12 document." Um, I have now have a, a mandatory secure uh, um, review of his FBI file. His FBI file he filed for in 1988, and he got it back, and it's 61 pages. And of the 61 pages, 55 pages are withheld in total. No, no, like one word, nothing. Everything on those pages is are withheld, and it's withheld um, under an exemption of national security. So 55 of 61 pages, and Bill filed an appeal on it to get the rest of those pages, and it was denied. Now, I went um, just recently, and they said they couldn't find. I sent them the first page of the FOIA, and they said, oh, I couldn't prove enough that, that I was identifying a certain FOIA. But the FBI um, is now in this thing. We'll see whether they do it. But the, the six pages that were released all were mostly blacked out as well. So here you have a guy, a UFO researcher um, at the time, who has basically his entire file from the FBI under national security withheld, which tends to tend to indicate that he was on to something, that this was not just some researcher who, um, you know, was just some minor player. He was a big player. And I talked to Stanton Friedman just um, a couple of months ago and asked him again, because his FBI file, he filed for it as well. And he was part of a team that was working with Bill Moore on the MJ-12 story. And uh, Stanton, his whole file was basically withheld. Now, I don't know whether Stanton's going to file an appeal on his or try to get a mandatory review of, of what was in this file, what they had on him. But you have these guys with these files that are sort of totally um, pulled from the 1980s that were, were dealing with these very high end issues of MJ-12 and Area 51. The Area 51 story um, was actually um, opened up by President Barack Obama. When a president talks about something, it actually declassifies that subject. Once a president talks about it, it's declassified. So people can, if you're, if you're in a, a, my understanding is if you're in a, a, um, a program, you can declassify anything that you've classified 
on down. But uh, when the president uh, says it, so the, this is, I think, 2013, uh, Barack Obama actually outs the thing. He's playing around and he actually decides it's time that this gets out there. And so he's giving an award to Shirley MacLaine at the Kennedy Center. And it's at that award where he says, uh, you know, when you become president, um, uh, when I became president, I, I wanted to know what was going on at Area 51. And uh, I didn't know, so I decided I'd phone Shirley MacLaine. And, of course, everybody laughs. And then Barack says, you know, I'm probably the first president ever to publicly talk about Area 51. At that moment, the story is open. The story is out there, and it becomes public. And then you have these situations that George Knapp has pointed out. We're at the Nuclear Museum in Las Vegas, a whole pile of CIA guys show up at this museum and start talking about Area 51. And then you have the Roadrunners are allowed to bring out their story, which was done by Annie Jacobs in the Area 51 book, where they're allowed to tell their story. So the, it sort of opens up the Area 51. Before then, everybody was saying, no, there is no Area 51. It doesn't exist. Uh, you know, public affairs was saying, no, this is, you know, there's, there's a, a test base there. There's, you know, no UFOs. No, Area 51 is not a term. And they basically come clean uh, by Barack Obama outing it by talking about it. Now, one of the other things that I want to point out now is that a lot of people figure that, that you hear these stories that Lazar really didn't make any money on this thing and he wasn't really involved, which is not really that true. I mean, he they put out he put out a documentary that he and 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 um, Neff had put or Huff had put out shortly after talking about um, what he had uh, discovered there, and this is a documentary that they had put out. The other thing was that he had gotten paid by Nippon TV. Nippon TV was very, very interested in this story once it was done by KLS TV, and he did receive, I believe it was $3,000, uh, from Nippon TV. So it's not really true that Bob Lazar uh, was totally out of the thing. Once um, a couple of years went by, then it is true that he divorced himself from the story. He really didn't want to talk about it. He, uh, you know, he moved out of the Las Vegas area or out of the you know, Las, Vegas, Las Vegas and only recently has come back to talk to Jeremy Corbell and do this whole story. So Nippon TV had um, taken the story and this was done, and I'll point this out with this red flag, is that once um, uh, KLS TV did it, within two days, Nippon TV had, had done the, the story. It had gone viral. And George was actually the one who um, broke the story. But it was running around for a, a couple, of, uh, couple of months before that. Now, uh, we have a, a bunch of people who are sort of critical of the story, and um, I really don't take... Um, they, they have their opinion. Uh, I don't know if they were really there. Eric Davis has pointed out uh, a strange sort of uh, thing that he has said is that he doesn't believe Lazar is credible. Uh, he's not telling the truth. Um, um, and that the fact that he, he makes this sort of a strange um, claim that um, he's not trustworthy and that Area 51 is not the location of the UFO crash retrieval. It never has been. And which kind of shocked me that he said that because Eric Davis is a guy who has a security clearance and I've known him for a number of years. Uh, when Eric Davis says something, it, I think you should pay attention. He does know a lot of stuff that the average person doesn't know. And I think he's being very truthful. So I guess it's up to Eric Davis to sort of, D determine or to identify people where the crash saucer material is if it's not at Area 51. Um, and he talks about the EG and G, um, and basically, uh, based upon what he had, identifies Lazar as not telling the truth. Uh, and yet, Lazar, as I'll point out later, does pass the lie detector test, which means, yes, that is a red flag. Some of the stuff that Lazar was putting out. But the fact that he has lie detector test means that maybe it's something else rather than the fact that he's just making up a story. You have a number of times when presidents will out stuff. Uh, I make a reference to Donald Trump uh, doing a tweet about uh, Syria. And uh, immediately that is declassified what was going on there. 
it, it's, a, it's a situation where I believe eventually everybody wants to tell the truth. Like people say, well, why would they want to release it? Why would they not cover it up? Because I believe in the end, everybody basically wants to have the story out. They want it, want it to be told. And the material that they're going to withhold is the stuff that doesn't, um, uh, that's still a threat to national security. Once it's no longer a threat to national security, I think the historians will want to try to get the story out. Now, Tom DeLong claims he's been to area, sort of Area 51, and he also has um, been in contact with um, Bob Lazar. I believe in one interview he said he has the lifetime rights to Bob Lazar's story. Uh, he's putting out a book on, on Bob Lazar. So to him, the Area 51 story is a very interesting story, and he wants to do the book. And um, he he wants to sort of, you know, make it uh, sort of a story. He believes he's like a storyteller in Hollywood and he's telling the story. So he has got control. I've never gone to Area 51 until a couple of a couple of um, months ago. And I was um, uh, kind of uh, amazed. I didn't think it would be that much. But we, we actually go to the site and um, we, we go to the gate and it was actually kind of unnerving because we'd gotten all, heard all these stories about, you know, don't go under the gate, watch, you know, don't cross the line. And then we get there and it says, don't take photographs and stuff like that. So it is kind of an intimidating place um, when you get to the actual gate uh, of the, the, um, the facility. Now, one of the things I want to point out now is this whole idea of how this thing starts in, in some people's accounts. And this is uh, the idea of Los Alamos that, um, uh, Bob Lazar had worked at Los Alamos, uh, the national lab. And in June of 1982, he runs into Edward Teller at the time. And he claims that he's working, um, in some of the accounts on these, the, um, the big, um, uh, machine that they had there. And yet I heard from one of Bob Lazar's friends that he was building uh, radioactive detectors that he was providing to the lab and that uh, he may even still be selling this to his company. And that may under make it more clear as to why when he took George Knapp there, he was able to go from building to building to building to building and that he'd been in all the buildings. If you were just working on the cyclotron or whatever he was working on there, um, then you would just be in one building. And he seemed to know all the buildings, which would fit this other theory that I heard that he was building um, these uh, radioactive detectors. So he, he definitely was at the lab, and the, he did have this famous uh, encounter with Ed, Edward Teller. Uh, he's written up in the local paper there as building this jet car, and um, Edward Teller shows up. And uh, he's giving a lecture there and he introduces himself to Teller and he said, that's me on the front cover. They have this sort of a little, little chat. And part of the important story is, is that Edward Teller is the guy who um, invented the hydrogen bomb. And Teller is um, a guy who, um, uh, Rabbi, one of the, 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 the big physicist at the time that was building an atomic bomb said it probably would have been a, a better world without Teller that, that he, you know, had come up with all sorts of inventions. He came up with this 10,000 megaton bomb that he put on paper that would light California on fire, which would take off the, the, the entire East coast. And it was called basically the nickname for it was the backyard bomb where uh, Teller had sort of put this thing on paper that you wouldn't even have to transport. It was so big, you really couldn't transport it. But in the end, you don't have to transport it. You just detonate it because it was basically going to destroy the world. And um, so it's this guy who basically, uh, and I believe this is true, he does put um, Lazar onto the site. And the question is, why did they put Lazar into the site? So tell her this, this story is true. He's giving this lecture at Los Alamos. And um, the, the, with the teller thing, Lazar does this, um, this lecture in the early 1990s. And it's in that uh, the documentary that he does where he points out that an atomic bomb will, give a, you know, will wipe out two square miles. If you take a hydrogen bomb, it'll wipe out 20 square miles. But if you can get the... the um, the stuff that's at Area 51, the uh, get 100% of the nuclear fuel to detonate. You can basically take out, uh, you know, countries, entire countries. And so the, it was kind of a scary thing that Teller was sort of in charge of, of this uh, technology going on at Area 51 or that he was aware of it because he has this bizarre sort of background. 
Now, the, the, the whole story was that um, Lazar had been put up at the base at, um, at um, Area 51, and um, the whole story basically starts a little bit earlier than that. Um, it actually starts in um, April of 1987 when Lazar states that um, some of the people at S4 had been killed in a, they tried to open a, uh, one of the reactors that was being used with the flying saucer. They had to try to cut it open while it was, was running and that these guys had been killed. And that's why he claimed that they had brought him to S4 to work. The key part, and this is a, a big red flag, is where the story really starts. And it starts in the summer of 1988 in John Lear's house. John Lear is, uh, as I said, very famous. Everybody's trying to talk to him. Everybody's trying to get his, uh, he was putting out uh, interviews on, had on tape that he had done. People were trying to get his interviews. And people wanted to talk to him. And one of the people that contacts him is uh, Gene Huff. And Gene Huff wants his material and um, um, is a real estate appraiser. And so John makes a deal with Gene Huff. Um, if you come and appraise my house, he has a 7,000 square foot house. And John, as he points out, is always sort of in financial trouble. And he was going to refinance um, his mortgage. And so he needed an appraisal on the house to do this refinance. So he said to Gene Huff, if you come to my place and do the appraisal, I'll give you all these videos, the UFO videos that you want. So this is how it starts. Gene Huff shows up at John Lear's house to do this appraisal. And along with him is Bob Lazar. Now, Bob Lazar had worked at Los Alamos, and people tie this together, and it can't be tied together. He worked at Los Alamos in 82 and 83. He only worked there like for a year. Now, I don't know, or it escapes me why he left, whether he was fired, whether he quit, whatever happened, but he was no longer at Los Alamos. He had not been at Los Alamos since 1983. Now we're five years ahead. He has not been there. He has not worked in the, in the, in the, uh, with the top secret clearance. He has not worked in the scientific community. He is working as a guy who's running a photo lab. So you got to remember, this is not digital photographs. This is back in the 1980s when people were still doing photographs and you had to take them to a store to get the film processed. So Gene Huff would be doing people's appraisals on his house. And when you do an appraisal, you need these photographs of the house. So he was using Bob Lazar's photo lab to produce the photos for his appraisals. And it was... Uh, Bob Lazar's first wife and he who ran the photo lab, his first wife dies. And Tracy, who's the second wife, was actually working for them. And Bob marries her just before the, the whole Area 51 thing starts. So this is how it starts. It's in John Lear's house. Bob Lazar is there and he's holding the tape. He's friends with, with Gene Huff. He comes there and this discussion starts about UFOs. And um, um, Lazar says, I don't believe this kind of stuff. I was at Los Alamos. I would know if this was true. And John, as he's pointed out in a number of interviews, gave him three different things. One was the, uh, the um, location at um, Los Alamos. The rumored story at Los Alamos was that they had a live alien at Los Alamos. And one of the bizarre stories that sort of links into that was um, I've followed quite a bit with Ron Pandolfi, the guy who is rumored to run the weird desk at the CIA. Uh, when he first sort of interacted with the UFO community was in 1991 with a guy by the name of Dan Smith. And Dan uh, contacted him and uh, Ron said, um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you when I get back. I'm going to Los Alamos to talk to the alien." And uh, it was at that point, again, this was just these chat boards. Uh, Dan Smith put on the chat board. Uh, my friend Ron Pandolfi um, said he's going to Los Alamos. He's going to talk to the live alien. And when Ron came back, he said, uh, just a, a rule. He said, when you put this on the, on the Internet, uh, please do not put my name and, and CIA in the same sentence. So this story was always around that, that Los Alamos had a, a live alien there. 
And even though uh, Lazar could not confirm this, lo this, the live alien, he apparently could confirm that this this uh, place did exist at Area 51, the name of this, this place. And John gave him two other things. So this is how the story starts, that he gets this verification from, from, from Los Alamos because his father-in-law worked at Los Alamos and John and Bob Lazar had a friend who had worked at Los Alamos. So he still had these contacts back in Los Alamos and he confirms this stuff is true. Now the, the key to this whole thing is you got to remember that John Lear's phone is tapped. So when this whole thing is going on, they know that John Lear is in contact with his Bob Lazar, even though Bob Lazar is not into UFOs and this sort of stuff. So it's John Lear who's talking and to 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 um, Bob Lazar, and it's he who suggests to Bob, you should get back in, you should go up to Area 51 because he got these saucers there. You should go up there and work there, and we'll find out what's going on. And it's that is the reason why in November of 1988 that Bob Lazar starts making inquiries and he contacts Edward Teller to go back up. It was, it was, it was, it was John Lear who suggested this. And so you have a situation where they know that John has suggested this guy go to work at the base. Now, um, the Los Alamos thing is, is a key to fit this, this whole thing together. And you, you get to October of 1988 and one of the things that people leave out in this this whole deal, and I've only got a couple minutes before we end here, but um, the thing that people forget that I haven't heard, or I, I say people haven't talked about in the last couple of months, is this whole idea that a couple of weeks before Lazar makes the phone call. So Lazar makes the phone call in about mid, early to mid November of 1988. About three weeks before that, this famous documentary is run on TV called UFO Cover-Up Live. This is the one where we all heard the story that Reagan may show up with the live alien. This is the one with the Falcon, the Condor, the Avery, the uh, Gray's uh, autopsy stuff at, at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, there was a lot of stuff leaked in, in, this, in this documentary, and it occurs three weeks before. So you've got to keep in mind that at the same time that the Air 51 thing breaks, this very famous documentary, and it occurs right at the end of the Reagan administration. So Reagan is very interested in UFOs, and um, we, were, we had heard that that would be his last move as he left the presidency to make the disclosure. And in that, they show a flow chart. Now remember, Nobody knows about Air 51. Lazar has not gone to the base yet. He's still just a, a guy doing a, a film processing in Las Vegas. There's a flow chart that's shown on that documentary. And it has the uh, president at the top. It has MJ-12 the, and, and a bunch of other stuff that makes sense on the flow chart. But the thing that's significant on that flow chart, which was three weeks before, three weeks or a month before Bob Lazar makes the phone call is that on the flow chart, they have area 51 on that flow chart. So area 51, nobody knows what it is. It appears on that flow chart. And I didn't realize this till years after this documentary that this was on the flow chart before the area 51 story broke. So it appeared they had already, they were already leaking the area 51 story. They leaked it in October of 1988 and Lazar does not show up on the base until December of 1980. The other thing that's on this flow chart that shows that it may be a very accurate flow chart is that they show the parapsychology research unit, which was run by the DIA at the time, and it appears on that flowchart in October of 1988. Well, that was taken over by the CIA and declassified in 1995. So seven years before it was declassified, it was already on a flowchart in a UFO documentary, and it just went there and nobody really picked up on the fact that it was there. So in November, the czar makes the phone call, to tell her and he gets the famous interview and this is the key uh part that fits the whole thing the key um um i guess you'd call red flag and this whole thing and john has told this story i've told it and i don't think george knapp denies this story it appears in tim good's book that that that, that this happened and that is the fact that um when when you um 
when you look at what happened, he makes the phone call, and he gets a phone call from, not from, from Edward Teller, but from somebody else saying, come for, it's either two or three interviews. There's some confusion whether he did two or three interviews with EG&G, which runs the site. So he goes to the interviews, and it's either the first question in the, in the, in the, 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 f- the first question in the first interview or the first question in the second interview. And I'll leave it with this, and we'll continue next week. The first question to Bob Lazar in the interview was, what's your relationship to John Lear, and what do you think about him? So before they put Bob Lazar on the Area 51 site, they were asking him, what do you know about John Lear? They had John Lear's phone tapped. They knew he knew John Lear. And John Lear is the key to why they put him on. Because the idea was that Bob Lazar was going to take the material, which is exactly what happened, go onto the site, get the material, and take it back to John Lear. And because most people didn't believe 90% of what John Lear said, the story would get out and it would just bounce around and most people wouldn't believe it. So I'll leave it at that and we'll continue the story next week. Thanks. You've been listening to The Cameron Files with Grant Cameron. Any rebroadcast or duplication of this program or program content without express written permission from Grant Cameron himself or the KGRADB is strictly prohibited. The Cameron Files, in direct cooperation with the internet website beyondpresidentialufo.com. 